In this video, I'm going to introduce a kind of theoretical topic called uh, the onion of life. And in follow-up videos, we're going to do some real concrete stuff of why this matters, why it's important, and why it's helpful when you want to think about biological problems to kind of cut through some of the complexity. Uh, biology, biology is messy and there is a lot of complexity. And especially uh, people like me who are trained molecular biologists, we like to really get into the weeds and try to figure out all the different enzymes and all the different genes and how they're um, interacting with each other. And there's always more. And that's the problem. You've, you think you've got this well worked out pathway and then all of a sudden you find out there's another thing that's blocking that thing that was supposed to be activating this thing and now everything is reversed. Um, and so it can get crazy. And so one of the things we need are conceptual tools to sort of deal with the complexity because sometimes I think we overthink it. So in the biology of life is, er, the, sorry, the onion of life is the way that I've been thinking about this lately. Um, and, and what I've done is I've sort of uh, stratified, if you will, life based on time frame, geological epic, when did it evolve? Because the, the things that evolved first and have been around the longest, uh, those are, that's the core, that's the core bits of life that we want, <laughs> that we want to be really interested in. And then everything that evolves after that kind of uh, interacts with those core things and affects those core things and are also tend to be affected by those core things. But the core things never change. Um, and, and everything that's happened since those core things is just a way of manipulating them to get the desired outcome. And I'll explain all of that. Um, I'll just to throw an analogy in here real quick. My, my buddy Alan has, has said that, um, he's taken my onion of life, uh, analogy and compared it to DOS. Uh, anyone who's run a Windows PC over the years, DOS was a, a program that Bill Gates bought um, and he made the heart of the Windows operating system. And so DOS controls the hard drive and it controls the memory and it controls the screen and the uh, the very low level kind of stuff. And then Microsoft wrote Windows, which kind of sits on top of DOS. And Windows is a graphical user interface, it uses a mouse and you can open programs and run programs. But all of those programs, all that they're doing is they're just interacting with DOS, which is the low level layer that is the core of how the computer works, right? The computer works off DOS and you can add layers to it. You can add windows, you can add a network, but all that the windows and the network is doing is it's just telling DOS, it's giving commands to DOS and DOS is running the computer. Um, and that's what we have in the end of life because if you go back far enough, uh, you have the origins of life. Life uh, started around 3.7 billion years ago. The earth formed about four and a half billion years ago. It was very, very hot then. And then it cooled down and it took it, you know, five, six, seven hundred uh, million years to cool off. And as soon as it cooled off, pretty much life happened. And so that suggests that life is very thermodynamically probable on a planet like earth. Um, but life evolved with this core program and, and the oldest things you go through all the branches of life, you go to look at archaea, which are weird bacteria and yeah, bacteria, which are just regular bacteria, um, fungi, humans. We all have, we all have these things in common, NADH and NAD plus, NADPH, NADP plus, acetyl-CoA, uh, sirtuin enzymes, we have ATP and ADP. These are the core bits of energy and building blocks of life that all cells use. And like literally every cell, you can find some weirdo living in like a thermal vent that maybe doesn't have all of the, maybe doesn't use NAD plus because it doesn't work at super high temperatures or something. But generally speaking, all of life runs these things. And the cells know whether they're in anabolic mode, which means energy storing mode, or catabolic mode, which means sort of tearing down mode based on 
these core sensors that all living cells respect, right? All living cells are looking at this. This is, this is the DOS of, of life. Um, and so, uh, and so all these cells, and so when I say anabolic mode, we'll talk briefly about NADH and NAD plus. So energy in living systems is electrons. NADH has the electrons. NAD plus does not. So if a cell has a lot of NADH and not much NAD plus, that means that the cell is in anabolic mode. It has energy. It can grow. And, and what that means is context dependent. If you're a, an E. coli cell, if you're in anabolic mode, that means it's a good time to reproduce. So you might uh, build a bunch of, of, uh, of DNA and you might build some extra proteins and you might split in half and now there's two E. coli. If you're a fat cell, if you're in anabolic mode, that means let's store some fat. Conversely, if you're in catabolic mode and you're a fat cell, that means let's burn some fat. That might also mean if you're an animal cell, you could do some autophagy if you're in catabolic mode. And that means breaking down old organelles like, like uh, mitochondria that might have mitochondrial dysfunction and breaking those down and kind of recycling them uh, and getting rid of some old, old dysfunctional things. And so this balance of anabolic and catabolic and every given cell is really controlled at the core, at the core level by life, right? And so, so that was 3.7 billion years ago. Then 2.4 billion years ago, suddenly oxygen came into the atmosphere. And that happened uh, because these little bacteria became cyanobacteria and they got chloroplasts and they figured out how to make uh, well, I guess they probably didn't have chloroplasts yet, but they got all the um, a lot of the key enzymes that eventually became cl plant chloroplasts. And suddenly they got electron transport chains and suddenly they could create, they could take CO2 out of the air, turn it into acetyl-CoA and they could bubble off oxygen, O2. Now, when oxygen became, went into the environment, it created an absolute catastrophe for most life on earth because oxygen is uh, it, it, it causes rust, it causes fire, it causes all kinds of problems. Um, it's very reactive, it's kind of dangerous. And so when oxygen came around, we had to develop our whole antioxidant system. And that's where superoxide dismutase came from, and that's where glutathione came from, and that's where catalase came from, and glutathione peroxidase, and glutathione reductase, and this whole enzyme system that deals with the generation of reactive oxygen species by living in the presence of oxygen, right? Oxygen also is a super key thing that allows us to do what's called oxidative phosphorylation, which is what we do in our mitochondria. And that allows us to take acetyl-CoA and it allows us to convert it into a whole bunch of NADH. Uh, in fact, every molecule of acetyl-CoA gives us three NADH, which we can use to make more, N more ATP. And you'll see that's all that's all pushing us towards the anabolic side of, of the program, right? NADH, high NADH, high ATPR on the anabolic side, although if we're using acetyl-CoA um, and we lower acetyl-CoA levels, that's good. But still high NADH, high ATP, the ability to oxfos is pushing us towards anabolic. And so what we did was at the same time that we uh, developed oxidative phosphorylation, uh, we made it a little bit messy. And you can see this arrow with this dotted arrow that I made with oxidative phosphorylation pointing to ROS. Um, in our mitochondria, when we convert acetyl-CoA to energy, we make a lot of reactive oxygen species. For a long time, it was thought that that was bad. But if you see my last videos, like electrons in, electrons out, what you'll see is that in fact, the ability to generate ROS while we do oxidative phosphorylation is a way to keep an anabolism and catabolism in balance. Because ROS, if the cell is not in reductive stress, and that's an important uh, contextual modifier, if the cell is not in reductive stress, the production of reactive oxygen species regenerates NAD plus and pushes us back towards the catabolic side. And so, when, when oxidative life evolved in all of our antioxidant systems, 
we, we wound up with this balance system where we're making oxidative phosphorylation, but as ATP levels rise, we make more ROS, and that keeps the system in balance. And so, and so oxygen, so all of the enzymes dealing with oxygen, um, all the antioxidant enzymes, all of the complex one and co through complex five in your mitochondria, uh, NOx4 that I talked about and electrons in, electrons out, these are all, th this, they're all part of the second layer of life, the oxygen layer of life. And then after oxygen came eukaryotes. So eukaryotes are things with, um, they have organelles, which are internal structures within the cells that have membranes. And I already sort of um, uh, <laughs> hinted at this when I talked about chloroplasts. Um, you know, mitochondria have a membrane and they have electron transport chain. So do chloroplasts. Uh, the nucleus has a membrane. And so those are eukaryotic things. And so when eukaryotes evolved, we had... We, we added this whole new layer of, of sort of regulation. And, but the way that it all works, so, so, right, so the oxygen layer works because oxidative phosphorylation and reactive oxygen species generation are both affecting NADH to NAD plus ratio. And in turn, the, um, the NADH to NAD plus ratio affects how much acetyl-CoA builds up. When acetyl-CoA builds up, it slows down oxidative phosphorylation, and that also causes an increase in NADH potentially. And so, and so the oxygen layer is 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 affecting any you know NADH and NAD plus and acetyl CoA and the sirtuins, and all of these things are affecting oxidative phosphorylation. Cert one comes along and removes the acetyl groups from the enzymes that do oxidative phosphorylation that acetyl CoA builds up. Right, so you have this back and forth between the oxygen enzymes and the life and the basic life things, right? And so, that, so that's how life is controlled. And so then, so that's, you know, 900 million years go by, maybe. Eukaryotes were probably around before one and a half billion years ago. This is a guess. We don't really know. Um, and so eukaryotes add this whole other reg layer of regulatory enzymes because now you have all these uh, membranes and these organelles and they have to communicate with each other and so the two most well-known and these are hugely important regulatory enzymes are amp kinase and tor and so tor is is um, part of insulin signaling and amp kinase is a nutrient sensor it's looking at atp to adp levels and it's activated by by SIRT1, the mammalian sirtuin, and it activates the mammalian sirtuin. And so, and so you see it, and insulin is, is pushing up oxidative phosphorylation. In, insulin increases oxidative phosphorylation by burning glucose. That pushes the cell towards the anabolic state, and, and insulin is signaling TOR. And AMP kinase, on the other hand, is signaled by leptin, and I'm jumping ahead because... This outer layer is animals. Animals have all these different tissues and they have to interact with each other. So eukaryotes can be single-celled like yeast. So in yeast, you know, you have an amp kinase and you have a tor and the yeast cell has to interact between all the different membrane compartments. And that's why you have this next level of kind of signaling enzymes. Um, but in a... <laughs> now you get into an animal. Now we have tissues, right? And so, so insulin is, is signaling TOR, which is anabolic. And we have leptin, which is released by our fat cells. And leptin is uh, telling the organism, hey, we have plenty of energy. And so since we have plenty of energy, we can actually, uh, we can actually burn some. We can, like, because as fat cells get fatter, the fat cells release more leptin. Leptin is released by the fat cells. So if the fat cells are giving all this leptin, then the other tissues are like, oh, great. We have all this fat available. Um, let's stimulate AMP kinase. AMP kinase will activate SIRT1. When SIRT1 is activated, we're in catabolic mode. So, so AMP kinase and leptin are pretty solidly keeping us in anabolic mode. Um, AMP kinase uh, decreases SCD1, which is actually the example we're going to hear about in the next video when we get to real concrete examples of, of how this works and we get out of the theoretical and into the rubber meeting the road. 
Um, and so leptin is essentially it's it's increasing metabolic rate and it's generating more ROS. And the the, the reactive oxygen species are generating more NAD plus, and it's helping us stay into into catabolic mode. That's what's supposed to happen. Um, and then down here you have NF kappa beta, and so now we're getting into more complex life. NF kappa beta was the subject of my last video. Um, NF kappa beta is involved in inflammation, and I put NF kappa beta right in the middle because inflammation isn't really catabolism or anabolism, right? It's uh, it's 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 I don't know. It's right. Fight. It can potentially be fighting, invading creatures. <laughs> It's, it's very complicated. Um, so I put that down there. And yes, I hope my point is clear, as, which is that um, life, this core program, as you add complexity, you don't need to reinvent the core program of life. Cells, cells, all cells, your cells, run off of NADH and NAD+, and acetyl-CoA, and sirtuin, and ATP, and ADP. That's what makes your cellular decisions. And, you know, as we build more things, there's more complexity, there's more genes, there's more structures, there's all the things. But in every single cell, they're still looking here. The cell is going to decide what it's going to do based on these. And all the other things are just different ways of affecting these core things. And that is really important to keep in mind because you can get lost in the complexity out here. And I think a lot of molecular biology, in fact, lives out here. Like I, you know, the first lab I worked in out of college was a, a cancer lab and we were looking at um, protein kinase C signaling. And that's important, right? It really is. But it all happens out here. It all happens out here. And and we didn't know enough. <laughs> it's not that we didn't know enough. It's that the tools that you have as a molecular biologist are how to look at these, you know, all these enzymes and all these genes and how they interact. And that's what you know how to do. And that's what you're taught to do. And so you don't necessarily think about, um, you know, <laughs> we didn't, when we were talking about protein kinase uh, C and how it affected prostate cancer, we weren't thinking about you know, ATP to ADP levels. Sirtuins hadn't actually, I think, been discovered yet. And we certainly weren't thinking about NAD plus to NADH ratios. Those were kind of thought of as like something that you learned in biochemistry class and then you never thought about again and that everything that was happening was because of genes and genetics and enzymes and how they all interact. Um, I don't think that's right anymore. I think that these are still, these core ratios are still driving the bus. Um, and so I've got a bunch of fun videos coming up, check back in. Um, we're going to talk about the, in the next video, I'm going to talk again about SCD one, which is my favorite enzyme. And we're going to look at how we're going to take this from a very theoretical example. And I'm going to talk about how in molecular biology, things, you know, get very confusing <laughs> and we study these enzymes for 20 years. And we never quite figure out the core thing that's controlling them and, uh, and, and how if you start to understand the onion of life, um, you, you know, you'll, you'll design better experiments and you'll come back with results that are much more useful. And we're going to talk a lot more about how to, how to use that in your life. Um, so I apologize for this very theoretical video. But I think if you kind of get my drift on this, going forward to the video series, it's going to make way more sense. Thanks for watching.